Hello, everybody. I'm hoping that we are live at this moment in uh, our Media Savvy Citizens page. And um, I, I'm guessing we're live. I don't see anything here that shows that we're not. And so we're going to move forward as if we are. <laughs> Tells me we're on. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so we have a special guest today. Uh, it's Dr. Antonio Lopez from the John Cabot University. He's a professor there and the head of the communications department. Is that right, Mr. Antonio? Right. Yes. <laughs> and you wrote a book called Echo Media Literacy, and I'm so fascinated by it. In fact, I've been inspired by your work that I've done a few things in the classroom with you know some of some students. Um, years past. And so I want you to, uh, well, welcome. What, first of all, tell me, what time is it in Italy <laughs> right it's now? Five in the evening and it's dark at this point. So <clears throat> it feels like nighttime for me. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I, think, I love that. I mean, I love the, that there's a time change and we have different realities <laughs> at this moment. <laughs> um, I am curious to hear, first, I guess I would like to do some definitions, some, you know, setting up some, a baseline for people so they understand what is echo media, what is echo media literacy in the way in which you define it. Okay, well, let me give some background, which will kind of help explain how I developed this concept. So uh, <clears throat> I've known you for a long time. We've been doing media literacy for years. And I did all my media literacy training in New Mexico, actually, 20 years ago. And uh, as I got involved with the media literacy movement, I was also very interested in ecological issues. I've always been interested in the environment going back to when I was a kid. But you know, in high school, I was very active in the anti-nuclear movement. So this was something I always cared about. And uh, I always felt there was something missing in media literacy about the environment. And, I would, you know, research materials, and it just could. There'd be a little bit of a mention here and there, but it was completely absent. And also, as I got into media literacy, I decided to go back to school. I went back to uh, uh, graduate school to study media studies at the new school, like you, Pamela. And uh, once again, I was learning all kinds of new things, but nothing really to do with the environment, with very few exceptions. So <clears throat> this problem really intrigued me. And when I went to do my PhD research, I decided to focus on uh, how to green media literacy. And so I did a deep dive into media literacy organizations. I interviewed media literacy practitioners and I was trying to understand why there was such a disconnect between media and the environment. And there's a lot of reasons we could get into that later. But uh, one of the most, important reasons is, first of all, when you ask people what is media or what are media, which would be grammatically correct, they usually uh, assume you know what they're talking about, but it's a metaphor and it could be many different things. So quite often when people say the media are this or that, they usually mean something like mass media, and depending on what your generation is, they could be television, newspapers, radio, things like that. And so it occurred to me part of the problem was the metaphor that the, the, the word we use was really valuable and it could mean so many different things. So uh, that was part of the problem. Uh, the other problem was that uh, most people didn't understand that there was a relationship between media and the environment. And I've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, 10 years ago, I gave a presentation in London at a media literacy conference on this topic, two people came to my workshop. Next door, there was a workshop on Facebook and it was like 150 people. So it was like me versus Facebook. We talked about the environment and there was two people there and it was great. I mean, I had a great conversation with them and I sort of laid out my argument and like, oh my God, I can't believe there's this connection. So you're probably thinking to yourself, what is that relationship? You being the world out there in Facebook land and uh, so <clears throat> I break it down to two, two areas and then I'll get into what I mean by ecomedia. So I talk about the uh, ecomedia my print and ecomedia or ecological footprint. So the footprint has to do with the, the physical impact of media on the environment. So 
uh, there's many stages to this. The first primary stage would be uh, the mining for minerals. So, you know, the, the minerals we use uh, for our circuits, circuit boards to make our phones vibrate for the antennas to work. Those primarily come from regions in like Central Africa. And, um, and also you think about all the metals that are mined like copper, et cetera, many come from South America. Lithium, which is important uh, Mineral for our batteries comes from the Andes. So all this stuff has to be take, extracted from the earth before we can even have our devices. And then that stuff gets, has to get shipped and it has to be built and it has to be manufactured. Think about all, you know, a, a phone has plastic, metal, uh, a glass, and our computers have these metal casings, especially if you have a, a rack. And then they have to be assembled physically in quite treacherous conditions, mostly in China. And also the labor conditions where the minerals are mined are also incredibly exploitative. A lot of child labor is involved with that. You may have heard the term conflict mineral, which relates to the fact that these the mining of these minerals uh, causes wars and empowers warlords. And I mean, that's a, that's a different story I could get into. So you have then the physical manufacturing, which requires all kinds of chemicals, uh, one thing that you might find interesting is that when you get the, when you buy your TV or gadget and you take it out of the box, you'll notice that there is no fingerprints on it, even though it was actually people who put it together. Why is that? Well, people, there's chemicals that they put all over to get rid of those finger, tr fingerprints. It's removed the trace of human presence. So we almost think like this is magic, you know, that these things come from like Santa Claus just delivers them for the ethers but they come for the earth. So there's that, and then there's the, 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 they're shipped. And then the e-waste, you know, what happens to all of our gadgets when we're done with those? And then, you know, they're quite, there's a lot of toxic chemicals in our gadgets. <clears throat> well, only 13% of our e-waste gets actually recycled. And when it does get recycled, it usually gets shipped to places like Ghana or China or in India, where you have sort of like these lopen proletariat type rag picker people who have no status in society in these pits, putting these circuit boards over fires, breathing the smoke, trying to melt these chemicals out. I mean, it's a very physical thing. So rather than us having this immaterial economy, we're actually in a very highly industrialized material economy. But all the, the sort of the propaganda of, of marketing, of computers, of that they somehow uh, have a light impact on the world is just simply not true. Then <clears throat> you have to consider uh, our data is also physical. It's not in the air. It's not like just magically appearing out of the ethers. It lives on servers. Servers are powered by electricity. Electricity is mostly powered by uh, fossil fuels. Now, some companies are doing a better job of using renewable energy like Apple is definitely improving. App, so is Google and Facebook, but most of our internet produces as much CO2 as the airline industry every year. So uh, that's a pretty massive carbon footprint. And uh, what's interesting, uh, I've been posting some of this stuff on Facebook, uh, AI has a huge carbon footprint because if you have all these server farms that are trying to generate, do facial recognition or trying to learn voices, you, you know, they, they require a lot of server power and a lot of machines. You have these big buildings full of machines. So that's the physical part. That's, that's the ecological footprint. The, the mind print is uh, the way that media impacts our beliefs about uh, the environment. For example, in the US, you know, still a lot of people don't believe climate change is real. Well, why is that? Even though science says it's, it's clearly a fact because the, the fossil fuel industry has successfully propagandized and games the media and the news in particular to convince people to create doubt. It's the same tactics they use for the tobacco industry and the chemical industry, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, also uh, media influences our, uh, our beliefs about uh, consumerism and you know, this idea of just that we can buy anything and dispose of it, that there's no consequence for that. But I, I wanna say that the, on a hopeful note that media are, are also very important for uh, educating us about environmental issues, helping people connect. Anyone who was interested in like the Dakota Access Pipeline struggle, um, 
learned about it probably through media. So media is also an important tool for solidarity, for empathy. So I don't want to say it's all bad, but we also need to identify the problem. So when you consider all of that, I, I use the word eco-media because it's a way of, of bringing media back to the reality of what it really is, which is it's part of the environment. It is of the environment. As uh, one scholar puts it, you know, before there's data mining, there's earth mining, you know, that we have to use the correct terminology in order to, to change the way people think. And so it's a way to, you know, switch how we're, when we imagine media, if we say eco media, it immediately points an arrow at, hey, this thing that we're talking about has uh, uh, immense ecological impact and it's part of the environment. Thank you for, wow, that's, <laughs> you could not have done a better job at explaining all the complexities of, you know, of the media environment, right? And also like the comp, the context, right? The context in which you and I are able to go live on Facebook, have this conversation, what did it take? So there's, you know, the servers and all of that, but then there's the physical computer or telephone devices that we're using, you know, and even to the point of the way you explained it, where, where the lack of fingerprints on the device, you know, removes the human aspect. And so uh, the way that I am understanding everything that the, in the context in which you put it was, let's put it back into the human aspect of it. And what did it take, including possibly child labor, right, to, put, to get these devices out to us so that we could benefit. And there are positive things that come out of it. We are able to educate people and do things with these devices, but let's remember that it lives within a context. And so that you had said eco, the eco media, right? The defining that and the media literacy, right? The eco media literacy, cause you know, that's part of um, language and symbols and techniques that people use and what language and symbols are being used to maybe remove the human element from what we're doing and you know and how do we place it in a play in a and that's what you're doing right is placing it into a language that reminds people of um the where it lives what media is and and the context at which it lives um, which i find I, I feel like that's a really strong point which is a little different than comparing there I know there are other people who compare media and use media ecosystem as an analogy for polluting the environment disinformation misinformation like Whitney Phillips is you know speaking about this and she uses the analogy of media as like posing it into that it's part of this environment you know this that almost like a just an, an, an analogy right of like what we do with our information and how that um, well, your point about language is really important because especially you, you, you brought up a really good point about this word ecosystem, because this is a term that I find highly abused because quite often, especially in the uh, entrepreneurial world and the business world, it's a very hip term to use, right? These are the iPhone ecosystem or the Facebook ecosystem. And so I see two, there's two aspects to this. One is on a positive side, it's a recognition that these systems are complex, that they are systems. So whereas the way we used to think about media, it was like sort of this top down, you had you know, three broadcast companies, one to many broadcasting to the world, that the ecosystem metaphor is a recognition that is really much more complex than that. But the problem is that where's the eco in that ecosystem? You know, it's like, it's, it's really lacking. And even in, in media studies, you know, they, they, there's the field of media ecology and uh, this, like you were mentioning, the, the metaphor of the environment, the media environment has been around for a while. I mean, that's now going back to the 70s, people use that term, which again, it recognizes that media are something that we inhabit, that we're around, but all those uses historically have always been missing the, the ecological aspects of it. Even media ecology, which comes from like McLuhan and Postman, these people that are really important figures in media studies, don't recognize the environmental impact of the media. It's completely absent. So part of that, I think, is part of the problem, going back to my original point with, with media literacy, 
is I think there's, there's a legacy that we've inherited through modernity, this idea of the body and the mind being separate. And somehow that the idea or the, the ideas are immaterial, that ideas and our minds are separate from our physical bodies. So we sort of internalized this idea when we talked about media, that somehow media is just, all it is is about ideas, so that these ideas are somehow separated from, from the physical world. So the, the, using ecomedia as a way to you know, few, bring those back together. But I do want to make a point uh, about modernity and how it's really important when we talk about, you know, as you mentioned, these big systems that what makes Facebook possible? Well, what makes it possible is, is really a legacy of colonialism because you have to go back to see how is our <clears throat> global economic system structured? Why is it that you have child labor in Africa and you know, quasi enslaved labor in China making our products? Well, this is an, uh, an economic system that was built first on slavery, then on colonialism. And, and the wealth that produced and created that system is a legacy of colonialism. So one of the important currents in eco-media and eco-media studies is this idea of eco-justice and that we can't just critique the problem of the environment without recognizing income quality, racism, or all these other factors that go into the way that this system has been constructed. And I think it's important to recognize that. And that's a huge part. It's one aspect of media literacy is looking at all of the systems, right? And what goes into what we're doing here. Um, and um, But I, I, I wanna touch on a few, one more, one major thing, which is just any recommendations that you may have for K through 12 teachers or univers university professors that they can like take with them and begin to kind of open this up this kind of conversation up in their classrooms, whether it's through an activity or a series of activities, or if you have any recommendations as far as what, what uh, <clears throat> educators can do in classrooms. Yeah, I mean, I do actually a really simple exercise. This is just a, a way to get people to open up their, their thinking about this. So this is uh, from uh, Buddhist mindfulness uh, uh, exercise you would do if you were with a teacher in a class and you know the teacher might hold up a piece of paper it's i mean it's all white i'm sorry you can see there's some stuff behind here because there's light behind it but the teacher would ask here's a white piece of paper you know, where uh where are the clouds in this paper right and you could do the same thing you could take your your device and sort of get a blank screen and say you know where where are the clouds here in this screen okay and people could think about this, you know, usually like the, the novice would say this, if we were like in a Buddhist environment, well, the, the clouds are white, the paper is white. So maybe that's, that's the clouds. But the, the answer is really that the, the clouds are in the paper because the, the paper is made of organic material, right? And so the plants or the trees that were used to make the paper were grown with water. And where does the water come from? It comes from the clouds. And you just sort of you can sort of deconstruct the whole system that produced the paper. And likewise, you could just ask the students, you know, how is this made? You know, like, where does this come from? What's in it? And uh, so, you know, getting them to focus on uh, the material aspects of, of, of the devices, um, you know, it depends on the, the what, what level of uh, what age you're working with. I mean, kids get this stuff pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, what I tried to do is start really with uh, looking at ethics and values. And <clears throat> I use a lot of uh, like a you know YouTube channel where I've collected a lot of ads. And I will just show like a, 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 an ad for some product. And of course, it's not random. I choose certain ones because of what's in the ad. And I asked the students, you know, I explained to them the concept of what is ecocentric versus anthropocentric. And anthropocentric is, uh, you know, the idea that something is made for humans and only for the benefit of humans. And ecocentric is this idea that humans and uh, the environment are equal. You know, it's like a circle as opposed to a pyramid. And so that we have a, at least a baseline understanding of that. 
And then I'll just show an advertisement and I'll ask, you know, what kind of values are being communicated through, through here? Are these ecocentric or are these anthropocentric? And then try to get them to understand, well, why is that? And, you know, what, in terms of the impact on the environment, what kind of impact does this particular media have? It could, you could talk about the physical characteristics, but also the, the messaging itself. And, you know, I, I go deeper into this because I recognize that there's a spectrum of environmental, what, what is called environmental ideology, which is a belief of how, how humans in, in the environment, what, how humans should act on the environment. I don't like to use this, it's very, language is really hard because we, I'm not, I don't wanna say humans and environment because we are the environment, you know? <laughs> so that's maybe also just to help kids uh, recognize the fact that you know we're we're comprised of air and water and you know all the, all the elements make us who we are and we're part of the environment. I challenge anyone to hold their breath for more than ten seconds and see if they'll stay alive. You know so, and then you know and then, uh, but on a on a deeper level, there we have beliefs about and different cultures have different beliefs. So for example, you know living in a place like Taos. You, you have a, a, a very interesting situation where you have a, a spectrum of environmental beliefs ranging from sort of modern American capitalist to colonial Spanish to Native American. And all of them have different attitudes and cultural uh, uh, approaches to, to uh, living in, in, in the land. You know, I think we talked before about like the acequia and, and water ditches and how you can even talk about an as a as a communication system. And the fact that you have to negotiate, you have people have to, to monitor and to get feedback and to work in, in groups to make to ensure that water is distributed. And water is a good metaphor for media. I mean, so there's different ways to tie media to people's local realities and everyone lives in a different place. So you have to kind of situate where you are with what people know. That's always really important. Otherwise, you know, people don't really care they, they care more, as the research shows, they care more about, they'll, they'll learn something if they care about it and if it relates to their personal life. So anyways, my point I wanted to say is that there's a range of environmental ideologies and you can find advertisements that match any, any one of these. You could go from the extreme anthropocentrism to extreme ecocentrism. I mean, there's a lot of beautiful media that's been produced about that promotes uh, environmental well-being, a love for the environment. You can find all that stuff and just put it up there and have do compare and contrast and have, you know, as we do as media teachers, always, you know, find the material, discuss the material. And I love to do juxtapositions as a way to sort of generate discussion. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. And those are awesome examples. In fact, I took that one example of yours a while back of, you know, looking at the cell phone and let's deconstruct the cell phone. I had a whole see we we did an exercise on like what do you you know the set the, all the where does it come from and the rare earth minerals and then we went deep into like understanding what rare earth minerals are and like the connection to you know to the earth and the mining and the ethics of that but also there were students who were like it smells like this it tastes like this i mean they like okay. really got into it which i thought they were That's like awesome. eighth, eighth grade yeah mm -hmm. and and i found it um and i think they appreciated it as well because it, it related like you said it relates to them it's something that they would care to know you know the cell phone i mean demystifying a cell phone um is well, in, in fact, so much, and you could go so you know so, so many places with that. We could assume um, that all of them have a device, and they, for an assignment, analyze their own device. So that right. makes it more personal. Right. Yeah, that's true. So thank you. I wish we could continue this conversation for another <laughs> hour or two. Maybe we'll have you back on, and we can <laughs> chat again about. Um, you know, about echo media literacy, because what you, you know, the message that you bring and what you have to say, I think is really valuable for us to just center us and ground us and have a consciousness around like what we're doing here with these devices and, and awareness of like, there to be, um, you know, the more like, especially as we even move into, you know, Christmas time and, and people like they're like these disposable things, but what impact is it having? And to, just to have that reflection, um, I think is important.
you know, to continually be reminded of, of the echo <laughs> on, on the media. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us, Antonio. Um, yeah, nice to see you. Is there any parting words, anything you have to say before we sign off? Yeah, actually, I, just do a plug for the fair phone if you haven't heard of it. It's a fair trade phone, so you don't have to buy a bad something bad for your buyer. This is something, and you can take it apart, fix it yourself. So if you want to learn more about like actually an alternative to the normal iPhone, look up. It's, it's it says it should say fair phone, but look it up because it's an alternative model of how media could be produced in a sort of healthy way for the environment. Oh, that's so cool. Thank you. I remember reading about the Fairphone a while back and the Fairphone also, um, like, isn't that the phone that you can use all over Europe that like you can get service anywhere or is that the Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's primarily, it's produced in Amsterdam. It's primarily for Europe. I, I don't know it's available availability in the US, but you could put two, two SIM cards in it. So when I go to the US, I put a US SIM card and I use it in the US and then I have a European SIM card, but it's, you can fix it. That's one of the, the, you know, you can't fix an Apple, but this, they have instructional, it's like Legos. You could take it apart. Oh, that's so cool. They send you a screwdriver. You could change the battery. You could upgrade the camera and they, they use, they pay fair labor prices for, you know, so it's a little bit more expensive than a normal phone, but you're paying a fair price like you would if you bought fair trade coffee, for example. Wow. Well, there's, you know, there's a good example of living by your words. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Cool. All right. Well, nice to see you. And uh, till you. next time. Take okay, care. Okay, bye. Bye.